Um, my name's Charlotte Higgins, and I'm the Chief Cultural Writer of The Guardian, and it's uh, my great pleasure to uh, welcome you here to this latest uh, session in the series of Almeida Questions. Um, the title of this particular event is uh, Guaranteed to Strike Fear into the Heart of an Anglophone Person, because it involves a Danish word that's very difficult to pronounce, getting hygge with it. <laughs> why we have fallen for Scandinavian culture. Um, despite the difficulty of pronouncing uh, that word in English, Hugo, which we will talk about a little bit later, was one of the most overhyped British lifestyle trends of 2016 and uh, became one of the words of the year 2016 alongside Brexit and Trumpism. Um, and perhaps that moment might have been seen as marking peak Danish um, Britain was already pretty much in love with um, Danish social security, um, the Danish welfare state, Danish design, Danish uh, Scandinois, uh, new Nordic cuisine, beautiful Danish lamps and tables and other forms of wonderful Danish design. But uh, no, we continue to love Denmark more and more as we be evinced by uh, this great production of The Hunt which, uh, of course, is a theatrical adaptation of an earlier um, film by Thomas Winterberg and Tobias Lindholm uh, called Jagdhead, which uh, I think came out about 10 years ago. And if you haven't seen the film, it's also really worth seeing. But my experience of Danish friends who um, uh, live in Britain is that they were utterly, utterly confused and uh, amused by Huga becoming uh, a, a, a thing that we were all supposed to get very enthusiastic about. And I would like to ask my panel about that, but first of all, I will, of course, introduce them. Um, on the far side, please could you say your own name so that I don't screw it up, Lars? <laughs> please try. Oh, that's wicked, Lars. No, no. Tristan. Yeah, I'm very good. Okay, that'll do. His Excellency, who is the ambassador to London from Denmark, uh, he has served also in Mexico and Spain. He's in his second year of service here. Uh, he's a specialist in the EU, actually, which uh, is pretty useful, I dare say. On sitting next to him is Charles of Barcelona, who uh, is Danish, a translator of, of Scandinavian literature, has lived here for a very long time. Um, she is the author also of a really tremendous essay in the program book for tonight, which I highly recommend. And right next to me um, is Nina. Nina, do you want to pronounce your surname for yeah. me? Todstrup. Thank you. <laughs> Nina Todstrup, who uh, is a designer also based in Britain, but born in Denmark. And um, I think her principles of design are a great sort of embodiment of Danish principles of uh, kind of great design for everybody <laughs> and with a focus on environmental sustainability and so on. So enough of the introductions. We're going to chat. For about half an hour, we will then open it out as a broader discussion with all of you guys, so please do bear that in mind and have your burning questions ready. Um, but first of all, just a quick one to you, Charlotta. You've been here for a long time, and you have seen this arc of enthusiasm for Danish and Scandinavian culture come pretty much out of nowhere, I think. I mean, when I was growing up, who knew anything about Denmark? It was just bacon and butter that... Denmark was known for really. Um, how do you feel about that? I mean, you're a, you are a translator of Danish literature, so I guess it's uh, it's good times for you. Well, I'm I, I'm thrilled because otherwise I wouldn't have a job, basically. <laughs> um, it all started as far as I'm concerned with uh, Peter Hoes, Miss Miller's feeling for snow. That was the first book that really proved to British and American publishers that you could make serious money from Scandinavian fiction. Up until then, it had been very much either academic translations or, or niche products, but not something that anyone took seriously. And as a translator, we all thought, well, I, I thought that was great. And you wondered, will this last? Or will it be perhaps two or three books, and then British readers will shift their interest to well, Italy or, or France? And it, we were just that year's excitement. But it didn't stop. There were more books, and then, of course, we had the TV series of The Killings, and everything snowballed, and now it seems to be a genre in itself. And I have more work than I can cope with, and there are now probably about 
about 15 or 20 translators working worldwide, translating Scandinavian fiction into English. And Nina, what about this idea of Huga? Did you, I mean, you know, this was a word that was in fact, of course, used in Britain to sell a lifestyle which included design. What did you make of it, sort of sudden appearance as a, as a trend? Well, I was quite bemused, you know, to be honest, to read about it, as you also earlier mentioned that most of your Danish friends were. I mean, it's like... Could you define it, well, actually? I know it's hard to do that. Well, it's just quite hard, as you, you know, because you've been writing about it. But, um, well, it is a word that we obviously use and know when if we have a nice time with friends, you know, as a, you know we call it Hugo, you know, I mean, we'll have a nice social time together, you know, it's always like, you know, as you would write about, there'll be candles, but we always would have candles, you know, and in kind of a social setting, it's kind of like we live in a half the year dark uh, country, and um, so it would be just like a very social, nice time together, you know, or it could be family, or it could be friends, but it's that kind of lounging in the sofa, having something nice to eat. It's normally not around like a dinner table. It would normally be in the sofa, uh, chilling out with, yeah, a homemade cake maybe or something like that. But some like, let's have a nice time together, you know, or you would say after that was very hugelit, you know, after yeah. that we had a nice time. Um, is that relevant or irrelevant to your design practice? Uh, I think it's quite irrelevant, to be honest, you know. I mean, it has nothing to do with, with my design practice. But I, I, I'd realise that, of course, I've grown up with a very strong connection to my Danish roots, which I have not left, you know, so it's not like I would think that what I do is Scandinavian or Danish, but of course people that see my work would immediately think that it's extremely Scandinavian and or Danish, my, my work, um, because there is, uh, I like to work with wood, I like to work with light wood, I have issues about that it's sustainable, it's kind of quite functional. So, so there are some connections to kind of what people would normally describe as uh, as Danish design. Mm -hmm. no, it's not. Um, I'm wondering if the ethic and the aesthetic come together though in the sense that um, my understanding of a lot of Danish design is that it, it's not formal. It wants to create a social setting that is quite um, equal. Um, Know, baked into Danish modernism, as I understand it, is the sense that everyone ought to be able to have beautiful things in their house, regardless of what social status they occupy. Oh, absolutely. There, there is uh, an in <coughs> inclusiveness in, in, in what we are doing. I mean, it's um, it's not luxury. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely not, but quality. So it's not necessarily cheap, but it's affordable for everyone. And you would think about that that it is. In inclusive and and, um, and definitely, I always had a very strong uh, issues about that things are either recyclable or it could be made so it could be taken apart, or recycled, or I mean it's part of my practices and I don't think it's particularly you know for being Danish or Scandinavian, but I think we had very early on some quite strong um, uh, opinions about it and, and, and conversations about uh, responsibility as designers mm -hmm. for sustainability and there's a very, I mean the companies I work with, I mean they're, they're quite upfront with, with being um, C Corp registered or, and I would ask them, you know, or try to push them on, on these issues and, and, and there's, I mean, there's a definitely a, a also a very strong responsibility from the company I work with, which I find more here than maybe, or in Denmark or in Scandinavia yes, than, yeah. than here, or yeah. earlier on. I mean, yeah. of course, everything is changing now everywhere, but, but there have been uh, easier conversation yeah. about that responsibility. And last, this, this sense of, I mean, a huge theme in Danish culture, history, uh, economics, life in general, and I think the feed absolutely into the, the play that's going to be seen tonight is this sense of social equality, um, a strong welfare state. Where does that, as it were, historically come from? My understanding is that Denmark, Denmark was much, much, a once much larger territory than it is now. It was rather diminished in the 18th and 19th century and when it's now a small but kind of perfect country, famously. Is, is that part of where the this kind of particular 
sense that social democracy arises from, or am I on the wrong track? You're absolutely right. It was a, a bigger country 1,000 years ago. I mean, I remember... I was when the day long. But the King Canute ruled uh, England, Norway, Sweden, and Denmark at the same time for more than, than 30 years. So it was quite a territory at, at that time. It has become uh, smaller and smaller since then, uh, and it's the uh, size of the <coughs> people uh, today. Uh, where did it come from, uh, this sense of equality? It came, first of all, with uh, the peasant movement in the 18th century, and then uh, it was taken over by the social democratic movement in the beginning of the 19th uh, century as such. And uh, then, little by little, there was some kind of consensus in the Danish society about the, the value of the welfare system as such. So, I mean, you have different political opinions in Denmark about all kinds of issues, but nobody is questioning the welfare state uh, as such. And I think there's a, a bigger sense of equality <laughs> than the, the, the value of equality than you find in a lot of other countries. But I think that's a really fascinating point you make there because as an outsider, the thing, one of the things I had to get my head around when trying to understand Denmark, well, the sort of first thing was, oh, it's possible to be right-wing in Denmark, but that doesn't mean that you want to rip up the, Denmark, the, the welfare state. That doesn't mean, you're, mean that you're a kind of Thatcherite economy. You know, but that's a very good point, and that's also a big part of my discussion with uh, British politicians and ministers, uh, because uh, some of them have sister parties in Denmark. And then uh, they are talking about, oh, we talked to this party in Denmark. And for example, I mean, uh, it's no secret that the Conservative is close to a far-right uh, uh, party in Denmark. And then I said, do you actually know that they want to increase taxes, that they uh, want more welfare, they don't want to lower taxes? No, that can't be true. Uh, but that's the way it is. And also, I mean, uh, if you look at uh, a very uh, important and difficult issue in Denmark, immigration and integration. I mean, there's not really a right-left uh, distinction any longer. I mean, you see coalition built between the Social Democrats and some of the far-right uh, parties. It was a lot easier when I went to university. You had right-wing parties, left-wing parties, and they all had to depend on the center parties to form a, go uh, a government, so you always, always need a coalition. But it's very hard to explain the young people nowadays uh, because it's, it's a mixture. And the right wing parties are left wing parties when it comes to the welfare state. The Social Democrats turned into, uh, took over the position of the right wing parties when they came to, uh, to immigration, etc. Et so it's, uh, politics is a very complex issue nowadays. But it always depends on the central parties and the other parties. Mm -hmm. And then, but, but the sort of overarching um, principle that seems to be of Danish, um, of being Danish in a sense, is this, is a sense of social equality, the small country that operates on trust. Am I right, Charlotte? I mean, you write about trust really beautifully in, in the essay for the programme um, for tonight's show. And I think we don't want to talk about the play in detail because some of you haven't seen it, and of course we don't want to ruin it for you. But there is a kind of sense of those people who are very tightly knit inside the social group and what happens when something disrupts that very equal and very cohesive structure and maybe someone is forced outside that group. Can you talk a bit to, the, to that idea, Charlotte, or do you think that rings, do you think my interpretation <laughs> rings true? I think, I think that's fair. I mean, trust is essential in Denmark. There aren't that many Danes and the country is very small. And there is this sense that it's just easier if you can trust people. There was a system ages ago um, where if you sent cash in a letter and the letter never got there, the post office would reimburse you. Um, and that system was later horribly abused and the post office stopped doing it, which was very sad because it was based on this idea that essentially everybody was honest and you could trust everybody and, and people wouldn't lie. Um, Partly because it's not nice when people lie, but also because you were pretty likely to be found out. I mean, the country just wasn't big enough, and, and you know your reputation um, once you've lost it can be really hard to regain in Denmark because everybody, even before the internet, everybody would really know. 
Um, so trust is essential, and I think there is a naivety which comes up, which I, I actually think it's really sad that we can't trust people as much as the Danes do. I think it's really beautiful um, in Scandinavia, that level of trust, but it is abused and it is naive to think that we can survive by trusting, but I still like to think. Mm. I like to dream. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I feel it a lot, that kind of being here, that my husband keeps telling me, you know, like, you're not in Denmark, you know, I mean, there's a lot of uh, popping up just in everyday life, you know, that kind of, I mean, I kind of think that the energy of trusting people is unexpected here, and most of the time it kind of works, you know, when it's okay, you know, I mean, every now and then it, you know, might not, but in generally it does actually work, people are quite surprised, but it kind of works. Um, so I also think that, you know, I'm not changing, but it, <coughs> sometimes it pops up, you know, we have a little summer house with a community of other other uh, small chalets in a, in, a, in a row. And I'm, of course, the first thing, well, yeah, in, 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 in down, yeah. down outside Midstable. And the first thing I did was like, in the, uh, there was a meeting, got a, I mean, communal kind of thing, and I said, oh, why don't we kind of, I mean, I uh, was thinking, suggesting building a sauna, but knowing that was <laughs> kind of totally off, you know, that idea, of course, that's the first thing about it. Of <laughs> yeah, well, you know, but then I said, why don't we build, uh, have a, a, a shared barbecue, and why don't we have a shed where you yeah, have tools? Because it's more like it's a bit bigger than beach huts, but you know, you want to. And it was everyone was like, "What are you talking about? I mean, it's gonna people are gonna steal it. It's not gonna work, you know." And I'm just like, "What do you mean it's not? I'll fill it up again." And they were just not having it, you know. But that was that. I've kind noticed of the Danes. Um, I'm going to make a really sweeping remark about the Danes. <laughs> Forgive me. My experience of being in Denmark is that Danish people really like organised fun. <laughs> <laughs> Am, am I wrong? I mean, it seems to me that the, the group activity, the organised group activity, which I suspect may have been part of behind your impulse about the lovely... No, show it was very much also... Well, the problem, but it's, it was more practical, yeah. that kind of thing, okay. instead of we all have... We have we but it was an idea that was towards the common good. Yes, absolutely. Which is a, which is a beautiful Danish impulse. Yeah. I mean, I, I went to I went to a, um, a social a, a youth social club where we all had dinner for very little money, and then everyone played bingo except for me because I don't do numbers in Danish. Um, <laughs> but I wonder if the, um, the the kind of this sort of glorious sense of community potentially has its. Um, darker side in that if you're not in it, you're out of it. Um, does, does that ring any bells, Lars, or are you too diplomatic to uh, <laughs> um, discuss the darker side of Denmark? <laughs> but there's a very direct Dane who, you know, that's, that's another thing I noticed about my um, Danish friends, very direct. I think you got a point, but, but on, on the other hand, it's something I have encountered all over the globe. I live in six or seven different countries. It's, it's simply not easy to integrate, to become a part of another society as such. Mm -hmm. But maybe we are, in one sense of the word, more close than in, in other cultures. We we like small communities. I live on a road, I lived on a road in Copenhagen where we only seven, eight houses. And I didn't know these people before I moved, so before we bought the, the house. Now we have keys to each other's houses, our kids run to the other gardens, uh, they sleep at other places and, and so on. So we established our, all, our own small community in the great city of, of Copenhagen uh, as such. But to be quite honest, I mean, if you, because also I read your, your article uh, about it, I think it is difficult no matter where you settle down. It's not easy uh, if you're during the first years, uh, even though you might even be married to somebody from the, that particular country, it's not easy to uh, break into to these circles. I've been living in the US, in Mexico, Spain, Luxembourg, and, and now the UK. I, I don't think it's that different from Denmark. And yeah. the the, what you mentioned there that, that I love is this idea that you all had the, the keys to each other's houses and you made this community. And I think that's so relevant actually to this play, the, the kind of sense of 
the absolute closeness of the community, and that, of course, is what makes it particularly, um, the reversal particularly complete when that community starts to unravel. So I think that's, that's a really, that's sort of really worth kind of um, bearing in mind for, for the play. Um, Charles, can I ask you about Nordic noir? And I mean, do, do you translate many um, crimis and detective stories from, from the Danish? Yes, I'd say about half my yeah. work is crime fiction, the other half will be plays and, and mainline mm -hmm. fiction. And there seems to be an insatiable appetite for it. And for many of the writers I work with, it's also a way of exploring various social issues. I recently worked with a, a writer who lived in Greenland for a long time and writes a lot about some very difficult situations there. Um, I've also worked with writers who are using crime fiction to talk about um, the way that the Danish war veterans have been treated, um, which, you know, is, is fairly shocking, the way that, that the Danes are, are really uncomfortable with things not being okay in their almost perfect world. And um, I work with a writer who's at the moment who's writing about the clashes between the immigrant gangs in Nurburgring, in Copenhagen and the mainly white police officers and the way that that there are these almost subcultures or parallel societies that live within a few streets of one another. And, and yet are separate, um, and how you can live in many lovely places in Denmark and you can believe that you're still in, in Britain, like you know, 1950s Britain. Um, and then you can be in parts of Copenhagen where Danish is hardly spoken, where um, schools have a, an overwhelming number of non-ethnic Danish students and who just grow up with a completely different experience of what it means. And I think that creates quite a lot of um, stress fractures in Danish society because it's very much based on all the Danes being the same, having shared experiences, having shared rituals, and that doesn't seem to be happening anymore. And it's very hard, there doesn't seem to be much crossover between Danes and non-Danes. So your suggestion is that genre fiction offers a, a kind of a route to exploring a multitude of mm. social problems that might be quite difficult to tackle directly in fiction as it were. Absolutely. Um, and it, it makes for a much better read. And, and often cases in crime fiction are um, inspired by real life events, which makes it, um, I suppose, more poignant that these experiences actually, something like that happened to someone. And then somebody told it in, I suppose, more attractive way, with more cliffhangers, with, um, with more subplots, but a lot of the time when I speak to the writers I work, they will say, I wrote this book because I met someone, I met somebody who this had happened to, or I was in this place and I heard this, or some of them are very public stories. I mean, in Norway, there is a wave of fiction following uh, Anders Bayek's shootings because people are trying to make sense of how this could happen in their community, and that's expressed in crime fiction, but it's also expressed in, in mainstream fiction. So interesting, and maybe I don't know. It might be possible to see Yarton not the hunt, not entirely out with that genre. I mean, it is a kind of um, it's a dark, well, it's certainly a very dark story. It's not quite a, it's not quite a detective novel, evidently. But um, I mean, did, so there's, I, I want to make a connection to Dogma ninety five, but the main, the, which was the course of the great sort of aesthetic film movement that out of which I believe Thomas Winterberg sprang and the roots of the roots of this play are in that um, are in that that extraordinary movement that, that, that the last one Trier was part of. Can you talk a bit about that Nina? Or a, well well of course I am not a film expert but I'm very familiar with um, with the dogma concept as as such and um, it it is probably this kind of I can just see Lars von Trier and his gang having really fun putting that up, thinking, how is we going to make this Because really it was a manifesto, right, difficult. about difficult. It's a manifesto about making a film uh, up, I mean, it was not part of it, it should be a low budget film, but in the way that it was put up, like handheld camera, no props, no artificial lighting, and so it's basically for filmmakers making it like, 
that's not possible, nearly. You know, I mean, it's it, it they call it a bean spin. I what do we call that in English? Bean spin. But you know, a spanner in the work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so so it's from the from the start. It's like daunting that whole idea, and um, and everyone was, I mean, thinking this is a it's not going to happen. What a silly idea to kind of put all these rules up, and then and then they created these most incredible films that was really a movement that um, shifted a lot in Danish film industry. And I think it was the first time I'd ever come across any Danish culture of any kind, I'm, I'm afraid, I'm a, a, you know, ashamed to admit. Yeah. That but that I think it forced them to um, make really good stories because without a really, really good script it doesn't work, you know, so that was the first thing that, you know, that, and with a good script you get doesn't really matter anything. So it, 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 that was kind of the driving force that they, they really need to have these strong scripts. And then what it also I think forced uh, forced them to not. But they what they chose to do the directors is that they and I think that's very Danish. It was that very super real life interview like people. There's no I mean fancy costumes or makeup and it's like close up and whatever people look and even for the actors you're like you know it's like not just like anyone in the street but all the glamour was taken up so it was all about the so felt the so real you yeah. know the dialogues I and mean, you felt it's like being in someone's living room you know and the same with um, the heart I think it has very much that kind of uh, I mean you just film as someone walked in from the anywhere. I was just filming in the house, and it doesn't feel like a film set as such, you know. And um, uh, and I think that tradition or whatever I mean, of tradition, that kind of movement came from oh, from so Dorf, so so that. Yeah. And I think that obviously Festen was a Dorfman film, and yes. I don't think the Hunt is a Dorfman film. Festen, of course, also adapted for the stage and seen at this theatre in the past. Yeah. So, but but yeah. So I mean, of course, from uh, uh, Winterberg, it's. Uh, I mean, you can see the connection yeah. between the two. Yeah. And I, I really want. I really want to, you know, involve all of you. And I'm going to. This is my last question. So have yours ready. <laughs> <laughs> last, as a relative newcomer to Britain, um, compared with Charlotte and Nina, how do you? What's your assessment of the way the British think about Denmark? We've got a crush on Denmark, I think that's clear. But is, is the British understanding of Danish culture, history and society actually incredibly superficial? What would you like to see us understand better? It has to be superficial. <coughs> I mean, uh, it's a lot to require that you should know or study the Danish history or culture in, in, in detail. It's not that important in your, your oh, daily life uh, uh, as such. Uh, that would be a big thing to add, to add for. Uh, uh, so, but but it, it is alive and it is uh, kicking. And when I talk to Danish designers, uh, when I talk to architects, uh, talk to fashion designers, as I did, did today, I was together with 10 Danish fashion designers, they still it's, a, it's very, very much alive in the, the British uh, uh, not British culture, but British knowledge of Denmark, there's something special, it has to be something special, because we're doing extremely well when it comes to, to Danish design in uh, Britain. Uh, in a lot of different aspects, as I know, the architects are doing uh, very fine, the designers, fashion designers. There's a we great are, Danish fact, clothes are, shop on Upper Street, yeah. which is very expensive, but the sale is always So it, it does uh, play a role, and uh, also when I meet the uh, British politicians, uh, once in a while, the first thing they say before we get to, to talk about the, the Brexit issue is that uh, I watched Borg. Uh, tell me, <laughs> you know, and Borg to me was it was a, a great series, but it was completely normal. I mean, as I said, I've been involved in politics for 30 years. I mean, of course, it, this was for television, and uh, there were some additional uh, stories about it and so on. But that's the way politics uh, work. So that attracts definitely the attention of uh, the Brits and also, for example, I mean, we have kept on saying to this government over and over again, why don't you try to make a big compromise when it comes to uh, Brexit? And uh, that's a huge difference between Danish politics and British politics because in 92, the Danes voted no to the Maastricht Treaty. 
Hughes decided that how do we handle this situation? Uh, are we able to stop the rest of uh, Europe from moving forward as they want to and so on? So uh, we, have, we had eight parties in the Danish uh, parliament at that time. So they sat down and they formulated a compromise, the four opt-outs negotiated with the European Union. We got what we wanted. We didn't, uh, we didn't create big complications for the European uh, cooperation as such. We went back to the people and we got a huge majority and seven out of eight parties support this uh, compromise. Now that's the Danish uh, way of, of handling these uh, kind of issues. It took me a while to understand why it doesn't work in this country. This country when it comes to politics is about confrontation. I mean, you have the government, which usually has a majority, and then you have the opposition. And for definition, the opposition is against everything which comes from the, the government, and basically the other uh, way around. That's not the way it uh, works in, in Denmark. Anyway, just to tell you that uh, I, I have experienced that kind of uh, uh, attraction. That's fascinating. That's another reason that we should all have a crash on Denmark. <laughs> <laughs> um, please, questions from the audience. Yes. So, as much as we have a crush on Denmark, does Denmark have a crush on anyone else in the world? <gasps> we have really a crush on the, the UK. I mean, oh, no, 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 no doubt about oh, it. Mutual, then, <laughs> you know what my favourite <laughs> TV series was for, for 10 years? Midsummer Murders. <laughs> <laughs> It was the best time of Hugo in my small family when my, my son was eight, nine years old. Saturday night, we sat down and we watched Midsummer Murders. I mean, because, I mean, what a place in the world. I mean, you kill people every single day. You beautiful surroundings. And, uh, I don't know, it, it was wonderful. There, there's a cross on the, the UK, on British culture in Denmark, and it's been going on for years and years. Movies and... Uh, Films, uh, TV series, etc., etc. Football, by the way, also games. as well. I mean, there's uh, hundreds of thousands of Danes who go to the UK to watch football games uh, every, every single season. So there's also a cross on the UK. So I mean, uh, Denmark might be a paradise, but you also has a lot to offer. That's for sure. Yeah, well, London is a fantastic L L L city. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Charlotte and Nina have chosen to live here, so that suggests that you're kind of in love with. Well. You Exactly. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I much, I mean, I, I miss Denmark sometimes, but I much prefer life in the UK. I'm extremely, I'm a very happy immigrant. Um, I think when I left Denmark, it was, it was a long time ago, it was pre-internet, and it just seemed very closed, and I wanted to work with um, the language, with creativity, with, an, with, with various artists. I just wanted something bigger. I wanted a bigger language to play with. And, and Danish just wasn't enough. English for me was the greatest language and I am so happy that that's my specialty now. That's, that's where I work. I love translation. I love reading Danish books and go, this is, this is what they should, will sound like in English when I'm done with it. Um, so I don't think I'll be going back, but I do like going there. But Britain for me has an intellectual edge, it has a curiosity, it has a tolerance for oddballs, which I just don't really think Denmark has. In, in Denmark, one of the lovely things about Denmark is that it's great to be average. People love you if you're average. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. What they have a problem with is the tall copy, unless you're a footballer. But if you're good at something quite unusual, people don't really know what to do with you, whereas in this country, it's great. You can be as odd as you like. People leave you alone. You can get on with you. <laughs> I just want to know, Nina, when you did your barbecue and you went around talking to everybody, did no one say, that sounds great? No. In that kind of British way that means absolutely <laughs> not. <laughs> <laughs> because I thought, and I clearly, I clearly integrated more than you have, because I would never have suggested the barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> it's up there with, oh, you must come and visit us. Yeah. Oh, you know, yes. But I was very, I mean, in hindsight, extremely naive. But yeah, no. I mean, they probably didn't say that directly, but the, mes your the, face, mes no. the message was, was very, very clear. You know that um, that that does not work. So, but, yeah. but I think it rings true that um, um, I mean, we love the eccentrics and, and all those kind of like you can be as you like here. You yes. Know, and they, uh, you will see that also, I guess, in the play. But but I mean, at Copenhagen is five million. People city, it's small, you know. So however lovely it is, you know, it's and whatever. Most of us are attracted also to be here professionally. I mean, you're at 
the world state, whatever business you are in, you know, you are, you know, it's kind of maybe after Brexit not, but it's always <laughs> been the center. Of, I mean, of the design scene, the theater, the, I mean, whatever in music, whatever you are in, you know, you are in a place that are work-wise so much more uh, exhilarating. But I think we all feel when we go back, God, this is really civilized and lovely for a moment. <laughs> it's easy. It's an easy life compared to life in the UK. And I suppose we are... I think if you're raising kids or have need of... Yeah. Um, but, but I think we're the odd immigrants. We yeah. went from an easy country to a harder one. But it's also where the bigger rewards are. Um, I think the payoff for me has, has been worth it. I would never have had the career I had if I'd stayed in Copenhagen. Bizarrely now, I probably could because of the internet. Nobody actually cares where you, where you are when you're working. But 30 years ago, that wasn't an option. Interesting. Any more questions? Yes, in the front row. Yeah. Um, so I'm, an, I'm also Danish, and I moved here around a year ago. And one of the things that I find, which I've become very aware of now, in compared to when I lived in Denmark, was how the Yander law has affected me. Do you feel that as well? Because I think especially in a field which is very competitive, I find it extremely difficult to to like go up to what I actually what talents I actually have. And I also find that people here are very like vocal about praising you and I can I like I find such a difference between Denmark and Britain in that sense. I don't know if that's something that you Did you use a Danish phrase or word in there? You said what the did Yendelong? you think? Yeah. Was it the one Yendelong? Yeah. Yeah, which means like it's basically it's an unwritten law, which means that you should not think you are anything. Right. Which so is, this is the yeah. law. Of, this is the law of Yanta. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe actually, Lars, could you explain the law of Yanta to? Well, well it, it is it, just that. You, right? You're already dead. I mean, you, you, you simply just shouldn't think that you're somebody special. I mean, everybody is equal. And it comes from equal. a 1930s novel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but but it, the, yeah. the novel is a, a novel as such. But it's it's a very uh, strong feature of our culture and such. And I think about it every single day, like you do. Uh, I grew up in the northern part of uh, Jutland, where the law of Yenta is very very strong even uh, today. I think it's disappearing little by little in the, the major cities, uh, especially uh, among the younger people and such. But it's very much alive there. And uh, I was the first one in the family who went to university. I studied abroad. I accepted to the diplomatic service, up to the rank of ambassador, and I'm now I'm in the most attractive place in the world. I mean, I, I've had a fine career, but I would never say that in my, mm -hmm. not in my, <laughs> in my, my minutes. I would never say that. I, it's so quite how fine. You? I mean, I mean, I'm ambassador to, uh, to London. What more can you ask for? <laughs> or, uh, you know, what kind of degree I got from university? Do you want to hear about my grades? I mean, it's simply out of the question. I mean, so, I mean, I try to keep a low profile in here. That's a bit too long, and that's uh, fine. It's a lot of work because I mean, these Brits can't make up their mind about what they're doing. So, what it's, it's, advice it's really would you have for this Danish lady who is trying to train herself out of obeying the law of Yanta? First, you've done, you've done the right thing by coming here. <laughs> you know, you can take that. Um, I think it's really difficult because. It takes a lot to shake that off. There was a Danish Minister for Education in the 1970s who was famed for saying that which cannot be mastered by all will be mastered by none, which was essentially meant that if you couldn't teach something that everybody understood mm. in school, you wouldn't teach it at all because there was this idea that you brought the society, you brought us forwards as a group by never leaving anyone behind. It sounds really sweet, but it's even in Denmark there are people who are super talented and should be allowed to nurture that talent, and often they are the ones who leave. Um, because eventually, um, you just get fed up apologizing for being good at something. Now, I happen to be extremely good at what I do. I'm rubbish at a lot of other things, but I am good at this one particular thing. But I always felt when I was in Denmark that that was a problem, that it made me different. And different is bad. It's not, you know, it's not precious in any way. It's just a problem, because then you're different from the group. and. Coming here, I was allowed to just explore that. There also wasn't a safety net. If I hadn't been able to maybe work financially, there wouldn't have been anybody coming to my rescue. But I kind of like that because it gave me a reason to get out of bed in the morning and, and, and succeed. And I suppose one of the problems in Denmark is that the cradle to grave welfare can stifle people 
where's the real edge in your life if you know that no matter how much you screw up, somebody will always be there to catch you? It's a really nice idea, but actually sometimes you really need to sort of be looking at your choices and what you really want to do and fight for it. And, and it is through that that you work out how much you really want to do it. That was certainly my situation that I really had to go and knock on a lot of doors and speak to a lot of publishers and get people to listen to me. And I didn't know anybody in Denmark either, but it didn't matter. Once I knew people in the UK and they hired me, the work from Scandinavia followed on. But when I started here, I knew no one. And it took, it took a good decade and a half. Um, and there were times when I thought, is this really worth it? If I just stayed in Denmark, my life would have been so much easier. Um, but I am glad that I stuck with it. And I don't know what you're going to do, but I wish you the best of luck. Inspirational talk there. Thank you, Charlotte. <laughs> we can all take hope from that. Um, I think we have time for one more question, if somebody has one. Yes, please go ahead. Um, you talked historically about Denmark having been bigger and got smaller. I think most people will recognise that maybe this country is going to get smaller. Um, we're coming out of EU, I think, unfortunately. And we may even lose Scotland. Do you each have one bit of advice to how to survive a smaller <laughs> country? Or as a member of a smaller country? Wow. It's, it's history, isn't it? I mean, it's so many years back. Last, I think that's uh, for you too. <clears throat> advice being a smaller country, I mean, once in a while, small is beautiful. I'm not sure it's the case um, when it comes to the UK or smaller UK as such. Uh, hopefully, it won't happen. That's probably the, the best response. Uh, uh, I think I don't think I also think it's important to, to say that the Brexit is not the end of the world. It feels like it once in a while. I, mean, I feel like it every single day. But sooner or later, I mean, we'll get it fixed. Uh, it might t take a while, and then we'll move on, on from there. It's just hard to say to see the, uh, the exit for the time. Being. No, I think Britain will be will be okay eventually. I mean, the British history that I I know shows me that you as a nation have hundreds of years of, of things not always working out necessarily to your advantage, but finding a dignified solution. I mean, Denmark uh, has lost uh, the countries you mentioned. Um, also, in the last hundred years, Greenland, Iceland, and the Faroe Islands. Well, Greenland and Faroe Islands are still part of the Well, as a sort of home rule situation, mm -hmm. which, is, which is another global um, Greenland is another uh, geopolitical nightmare waiting to happen. Um, but I think eventually it goes the way it has to. And as you say, small can be beautiful. And Denmark needs to get smaller. I think we couldn't stay the way we were. Mm. And we all, we all survive. Yeah, Denmark doesn't rule Yorkshire anymore. The Dane girls no longer applies. And yet, they live in an <laughs> almost perfect country. <laughs> um, I think we're going to have to... Stop it there. I'm so sorry. I can see that there is a, there is a question, but maybe you can find us in the bar afterwards and <laughs> ask it there. But um, I want to thank you all for being a terrific, engaged, lovely audience with fabulous questions. And I particularly want to thank our great panel for being so eloquent and generous with our answers. Thank you.